Don't hold back the second dose. Public health saved your life today. You just don't know it. Is a phrase CNN medical analyst Dr. Lena Wen often draws upon for motivation. Dr. Wen's personal journey, shared in her memoir, Lifelines, a doctor's journey in the fight for public health, is as inspiring as her dedication to public health. After immigrating to the United States at the age of five and starting college at 13, Dr. Wen became a Rhodes Scholar and attended Washington University Medical School. She has served as Baltimore's health commissioner and president of Planned Parenthood, leading the fight against the opioid epidemic, outbreaks of infectious disease, maternal and infant mortality, and now COVID-19 misinformation. For today's conversation, Dr. Wen is joined by her former medical school professor and mentor, Dr. Will Ross. Dr. Ross is Associate Dean for Diversity at Washington University School of Medicine, where he is a professor in the Division of Nephrology. I'm Dr. Will Ross, a professor of medicine in the nephrology division and associate dean for diversity at Washington University School of Medicine. It is my honor to be here speaking with Dr. Lena Wynn, uh, who happened to be one of my students uh, when she was here at Washington University School of Medicine and one of our star students. So great seeing you, Dr. Wynn, uh, and congratulations on getting the book. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful read. Uh, as I was reading this book, uh, it, it, it brought to mind a similar subject uh, by uh, Dr. Laurie uh, Garrett, who wrote The, um, uh, the Coming Plague, uh, really insightful. Uh, I'm just curious if, 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 if there were a, a sequence of events or, or a certain reason uh, behind your desire to get this book out, uh, what type of story did you want to tell at this time? Well, first of all, Dr. Ross, it's such an honor to be joining you. I'm sorry that we're not in person um, back in St. Louis, which I miss very much. And um, but I am very glad to be together with you in this conversation. I learned so much from you when I was a medical student. You continue to inspire me with your work in reducing disparities and achieving equity. So I'm really glad to be having this conversation, which actually ties into the question that you're asking, because I think some people might expect that maybe I wrote this book in the time of COVID. And there are a number of people writing excellent books about COVID-19 right now. But actually, I wrote the book and submitted it to my publisher prior to COVID because what inspired me to write it was I wanted to tell the story of public health. There's a saying that public health works when it's invisible because that's really the work that we do is we work on preventing something catastrophic from happening. But as a result, there is no face of public health. There's, it's very hard to tell the story of something that literally did not happen. And so I had wanted to, first of all, shed light on all the great work that we did in Baltimore. And second, really put the face to public health. Well, then COVID happened. And I realized that the subject is even more important than ever. Although still, I think people are seeing public health as only COVID. And so now the urgency of the issue takes on a new level because yes, it directly ties to coronavirus. So what we have to do to prepare for the next pandemic and to get out of this one, but we also are recognizing the importance of public health like never before. Absolutely, I, I, I really appreciate that. Let, let's talk about the spark. You, you're absolutely really into your work uh, and it comes out in the book, uh, your, your passion. Uh, for uh, uh, systemic change, for widespread transformation. I know when you're in medical school, you were really active in health policy through the American Medical Student Association. Uh, then you moved on. Can, can you kind of outline, you know, what actually led to this type of uh, excitement about public health and your need to foment change? Uh, was it while you're in medical school or was this afterwards? It was a combination, and I would say that it actually started very early on in my life. You know, I initially, in writing Lifelines, I hadn't really wanted to tell my own story. I had wanted to write this as a story of Baltimore and innovations in Baltimore. My publisher convinced me that that might not be as interesting of a story. Um, but also, I think in my um, reminiscing about my childhood, I actually realized that 
so much of my childhood in a way is testament to public health. And I started writing down stories that I just hadn't thought about for a long time. I mean, I went into, I start the book, for example, by talking about my childhood in China. I was in, um, I grew up in Shanghai, China and came to the US when I was seven. My grandparents and my parents had a saying in Chinese of chiku, which means to eat bitter. And the full concept of this is that you have to eat bitter to taste sweet. I think so many immigrant families, so many families in general, parents and grandparents and other generations sacrifice so much in order to make our lives better, in order for us to be able to achieve our dreams. But I saw through my upbringing that even though my parents were often working multiple jobs, we still really struggled to make ends meet. I mean, there were times when we could not make rent and we were in and out of different shelters. And, um, you know, it's, again, things that I hadn't really talked about and hadn't written about, but in a sense, that those experiences for me growing up very much motivated me to go into medicine. And there was one very specific experience that I start the book with, which is talking about when I was, I don't know, a, um, a child, I was in elementary school at the time. I saw a neighbor boy literally die in front of me. He had asthma and his inhaler wasn't working and he really needed to go to the hospital. But his grandmother was too afraid to call for help because they were undocumented immigrants. And she was afraid of what might happen if the authorities came. And I watched this child suffocate in front of me. I knew that when I was able to go into medicine and go to medical school, uh, pretty early on, I knew that I wanted to enter emergency medicine and work in the emergency department because at that time, this is pre Obamacare days, I never wanted to be in a position where I would have to turn patients away because of who they were or because of their health insurance or their immigration status. But it was really also in working in the ER that I saw the limitations of medicine too. And that what people need at the end of the day wasn't just good medical care, it was also public health. You know, wh while you were a health commissioner in Baltimore, you cited the uh, need for a moral imperative. This is building on all those stories that you uh, refer to as a child. Uh, you know, there's this focus on, on social justice and the need for moral imperative. And you, and you made that statement uh, after the unfortunate death of uh, Freddie Gray. Uh, how did you uh, move the uh, Baltimore community uh, to really embrace that moral imperative? So I'll take us back to April, May period in 2015. I had started my job in Baltimore not that long ago, and we had the death of Freddie Gray while in police custody. And there was the immediate aftermath of civil unrest that followed his death. The health department at the time, we were called upon to respond to people's needs. And I mean, there were there were so many needs that people had that I think just were not recognized by the powers that be. And I'll give you an example of this. We had more than 13 pharmacies that were burned down, looted, or closed. And there were individuals who depended on their pharmacy, obviously for medications, but also for other supplies too, and their insurer, um, and even food that people depended on. And now they didn't have a way to access these critical supports. And so in the immediate aftermath, we were helping people get access to medications. We set up a 24 seven prescription hotline where people could contact us. And we actually went door to door to let people know about this medication program and a food service program that we had. But to your question, we found something that was really disturbing. That when we went door to door, people would ask us, what candidate is this for? Mm. They actually thought we were campaigning. And then they would say, oh, well, when we said this is not for a candidate, they would say, well, what survey is this? Because I think I filled out a survey last week. I mean, our residents were expressing to us that they always saw us there, us as in whatever health system or the government or whatever entity, they saw us there for our needs and not for theirs. And so we very actively went to people and said, well, what do you need help with? And the things that they came up with were things that we not necessarily might've thought about. For example, seniors said they really needed help with banking. 
And so we helped establish bus routes and brought and went to senior buildings to help people do their banking. Um, we also set up a trauma and mental health program, and we ended up setting up a 24-7 crisis hotline. We did healing circles with our schools. We ended up getting a large federal grant to be able to address mental health in 120 out of 180 schools. And so those were the types of things that we did, but not things that we said to the community, here's what you need but rather listening to their concerns and delivery on them. There are many people uh, who are outside of public health who will state that uh, it's kind of cost prohibitive to try to do these things, um, to address transportation, and housing, and, 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 and food access. Tell us a little bit more about what was it like on the ground, uh, trying to uh, garner resources, trying to sustain some of these great programs. Yeah, I have to tell you that it was extremely frustrating because we, it almost felt like no matter how much data we had, that no one cared. <laughs> because again, by definition, we have prevented something from happening, right? There is the face of a child who was lead poisoned. But what about the faces of all the children who could have been lead poisoned if not for the home remediation programs that we did? And one of our most successful program was our Be More for Healthy Babies program that involved more than 150 public and private partners to get together to help with the, address the issue of infant mortality. It was an, an extremely successful program by all measures. Within a seven year period, we reduced the infant mortality in our city by 38%. I mean, there's no one would question this as an important program, but year after year, we faced funding cuts to the point that we basically had to beg our local philanthropies. We had to beg our city and state health departments. And I mean, it was an extremely frustrating experience. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I'll mention, and this is, by the way, not meant to be a political statement at all. This is just meant to be a, a, a statement of a fact that um, in multiple years when I was the health commissioner, the city spent more on police overtime than they spent on the entirety of our public health budget. And I say this not to, I have, I'm not making a comment about police department budgets. I'm making a comment on how we don't invest upstream, right? The concept that we really need to focus on prevention. We look at the end of the line, look, I'm in your dog, right? And so, of course, I believe that when somebody is very ill, or when there is an urgent issue, whatever it is, whether it's health or safety, of course, we should be investing funds there. But what about all the work that we do, including early in life, in early childhood education, to help our children so that they don't end up in trouble and end up in incarcerated and needing police and public safety things later. I mean, what are we doing there? And so I think that was that was a huge challenge and I think a huge source of frustration. I, I guess it's time to step back and look kind of broadly at national policy. I'm curious you know, how you begin to address this. When we know that less than 3% of our gross domestic product goes toward uh, public health. Uh, uh, as now a, a, a senior leader uh, in this area uh, discussing health policy, uh, what do we do? H how do we effect change uh, among our legislators and other leaders to really uh, uh, more effectively uh, resource our public health? Yeah, I mean, it's a serious issue. We always felt like in working in local public health that we were robbing Peter to pay Paul that when there was one emergency that came up, the only way that we could get people to work on that was to pull them off of other projects. But actually in COVID, we are seeing the consequences of this. Recently, the CDC released data saying that the number of overdose deaths has now jumped to 93,000 a year. Um, and why is this the case? Well, partially because addiction is a disease of isolation. Um, partially also, though, because the same people who were working on the needle exchange vans, who are teaching on naloxone and, and overdose prevention, who are providing addiction treatment, they've been pulled off of that work in order to work on COVID. But the epidemic of opioid overdose did not disappear when COVID as an epidemic came about. And so we now have this backlog of really urgent public health issues that have not been addressed. And actually, I am really concerned about this going forward. You were talking about national policy. I'm very concerned that everybody now equates public health with infection control. Certainly, that's a very important component, and we need to do everything we can to bolster our infrastructure when it comes to pandemic preparedness. But I don't want all the funds to go to that. 
and then forget all the other things that health departments do. Part of the reason why I wrote Lifelines was I wanted to show the breadth of what we do in public health. I mean, in the health department in Baltimore, for example, I also oversaw school health, health suites in every one of our 180 schools. I oversaw our senior centers, um, running programs like fall prevention programs and support for caregivers. We also did restaurant inspections to um, help with food safety. Um, we did animal control because we often found that people who had violence issues against animals also then translated to violence against humans. And in fact, we also oversaw our community violence prevention programs with a program called Safe Streets that hired people who were, many of whom were recently in incarcerated. We hired them to walk the streets of Baltimore and, and stop crime when, when they see it. And so, I mean, that, I, that's just a small sampling of the work that we do. But I think it is really important going forward that as we talk about the new funding that must be there, we don't just stop at infection control, that we really make the case for public health. And I think that's something that people can help us to do this together. You know, uh, among those values, of course, uh, in our society is, is the sense that uh, all groups should be uh, treated with uh, respect and dignity. And uh, that lends to a statement that you've made that racism uh, is at play uh, in the perpetuation of these inequities and racism is a public health threat. Um, what, what, what do we do in our, in our, in our schools and medicine and our graduate schools uh, to really, in our, in our public health uh, programs and, and public health offices to really elevate that statement to actual, to operationalize that statement uh, so that we are, uh, that's ingrained in what we do as public health uh, officials. I mean, I would just say that back in 2015, when I first stated that racism is a public health issue, I got a lot of puzzled looks. I mean, I, I'm in a city where, you know, people are, are probably not going to balk at this concept, but I don't think people really understood. It was basically, well, what, what does that mean? And as you said, what are you going to do if racism is a public health issue? What are you going to do about it? Well, I first had to explain what it meant. And so in a way, we had we had to backtrack into this at the time to offer the explanation. We had to explain that, look at these health disparities that are there. Look at the fact that in Baltimore, a child born today can expect to live 65 years or 85 years, just depending on their zip code. These are disparities. Well, why do these disparities exist? Well, let's look at the unequal impact of cardiovascular disease. What about the fact that one in three African-Americans live in a food desert compared to one in 12 whites? Well, clearly there are problems with food distribution and access, but why does that exist? Well, then it goes back to the history of redlining and housing discrimination. So it, it took a lot of explanation and backtracking, but people, very quickly understood the issues that we have to deal with. And so I would just offer them a couple of thoughts about how to address it. One is don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, that we have to do something. Sometimes the problems are so big that there's often this kind of decision paralysis that people say, well, racism, I mean, that's a huge issue. So I'm just not even going to touch that. But there are things that we can do very tangibly that we should really commit to. If you are, for example, an entity that has metrics, as I mentioned, if you have metrics for different health outcomes, also embed a disparities or equity metrics into that. Or there are things that you can choose to do. I mean, in the time of COVID, when there are a lot of communities that realize that, wow, their vaccination rates were really unequal. And unless they did something about it, the communities that were hit hardest by COVID were going to suffer the most with lack of vaccines. And so they did mobile vaccinations. They went to people in their homes. They um, um, enlisted the help of trusted community leaders. I mean, those are really tangible steps that make a difference as well. And then, of course, all the things that you have already been doing but continue to do, Dr. Ross, in medical education is really important too. I mean, I, again, I don't think that I really understood or had even conceptualized what it means to study health disparities until your classes. And so I, I think that the work that you're doing has been um, really tra 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 transformative too. Well, Dr. Winnett, you know, we have uh, hopefully uh, uh, legions of young people watching this. What advice uh, can you give them? Uh, and then a little bit more about uh, how, how do we structure med medical education? to really inculcate this, uh, this, this understanding of health disparities um, and, and health equity. Uh, what needs to be done at the systemic level? But, bef but before you answer that, 
just some good old fashioned advice to all the all these young uh, people who are watching who, who really want to make a difference. Well, in Lifelines, I write a lot about advice because I was really fortunate to have incredible mentors, including you um, and a number of other people who, without whom I would definitely not be where I am now. I mean, when I first started college, I literally didn't know any doctors. <laughs> when I had career counselors and professors asking me, what do you want to do? I felt too ashamed to tell them that I wanted to go into medicine because I thought, who is going to believe me? I don't know anyone who is a doctor. How can I even tell them that, that I want to be a doctor? I mean, I had so many people say to me and help me over the years and help me be where I am. And so I included a lot of their advice in Lifelines. The whole last chapter, in fact, is about advice that other people gave me <laughs> that I incorporate into, into mine. And so I'll, I'll give you some of that. Um, one is to do what you can and not wait. So many students want the perfect opportunity. And I really respect that. I mean, you should have your dreams and aim for your dreams. But I would say don't wait for that opportunity to come knocking. There are plenty of things that you can be doing now. You can be building your skill sets. You can be developing networks. Some of the best experiences I had working for mentors are people who I didn't know would turn out to be such a great experience. And so don't wait. Do what you can right now. Um, the second ties to the other question that, that you asked Dr. Ross, which is what can institutions be doing? This also ties into my advice for young people, if you will, for students and trainees too, which is to seek practical opportunities. So many times, and I, I'm, a, I'm an educator as well, um, I of course believe in classroom education, but I think there is no substitute for that practical training. We do that for medicine. I mean, you're not going to let somebody become a doctor who has never seen a patient. Well, let's not let people be public health practitioners without actually practicing public health in communities. That's the best way, I think, for, to teach people policy and health promotion, show them disparities in action and what can we do to ameliorate them is to demonstrate to people and give them those practical opportunities. So for students to seek them out, for institutions to offer them. And then I will just end with something that my that another one of my mentors, Congressman Elijah Cummings, the late Congressman Elijah Cummings, used to say, he would say that you should channel your pain into your passion. That is your purpose. Pain, passion, purpose. And for me and for so many people, we do have deep rooted pain that may have come from our upbringing, that came from challenges in our lives, that came from places of deep stigma and shame. But it's now our job to turn that into our passion that fuels the work that we do, which is our purpose. And so keep um, hold of your dreams and do what you can right now in order to serve the people in your community. Well, Dr. Wen, thank you for speaking so so poignantly, uh, so passionately about uh, public health. And I need to elevate that for the good of all of us. Uh, uh, our nation will be in good hands uh, with that advice. Uh, thank you so much for the book. Uh, I, I'm sure it's going to be embraced. And uh, uh, as I alluded to the earlier book uh, that I uh, remind me of, uh, Dr. Garrett's book on the coming plague, I think it's important that we listen to you uh, because this will not be the last pandemic. Um, we, we need to have, a, an, this should be an eye opener for us. And so thank you for giving us an eye opener. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you a little bit more in the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Ross, for the gifts of your inspiration, for teaching me, for mentoring me, for guiding me, and so many others. And I also want to thank very much the St. Louis County Library, as well as Left Bank Books for hosting this conversation today.